Hello. Wow, nice packed room. This is awesome. I thought with the competition in the other rooms that I would have only two people in the front row, but apparently it's, it's much better than that. Welcome. Um, talk today is bringing C Sharp uh, nullability into your existing code base. Um, now, before I start, there's a couple of questions that I would like to learn from you. Uh, and the first one is, who is here to actually migrate their existing code base to nullable reference types? OK, that's good. Who is using them today already in their new projects? OK, most. That is good. Um, then I guess we can start. I do have a little bit of an introduction on how they work, what they are, etc. Uh, but once we're through, we will look at migrating your code, etc. So the agenda for today, first talk a little bit about nullable reference types in C Sharp. We're also going to look a little bit at the internals. Not really because I want to show you intermediate language code and everything uh, that is there, but just because there's a couple of attributes that are shown in intermediate language that may make sense if you're using reflection and everything in your code base. Uh, so that might be useful. We're going to look at annotating your C-sharp code, look at all of the different annotations that are there and how they can actually improve the notability analysis in uh, C-sharp. And then we're going to go full speed ahead and look at some techniques and tools that can help you to migrate your stuff. So with that, Let's go for it. Um, if you think about reference types, value types, and null, um, there's a really good and simple example to show you what could happen in a pre C Sharp 8 code base that doesn't have nullability in there. So um, what would be the outputs of this snip, uh, piece of code if we would run this? And you can, you can yell. That's fine. Anyone want to take a guess? It's not a compiler error, but it is going to throw when you run it. So uh, at compile time, at editing time, this will work perfectly. When you run it, it will throw a null reference exception. The reason for that is, of course, because we have this method called getValue, which is returning null, and we are dereferencing the length property of that string in the console.write line there, and that's going to throw because s is null at that point in time. So. How to overcome that? Well, you typically would add a null check. So you do something like this, where you say, OK, if that string is not null, we're going to print the length of the string. In the other case, we are just going to go with uh, printing something like string is null or taking a different branch in the code base uh, to overcome what is going on there. Now, how do you know that you need a check? For reference types, I don't find it particularly clear in this example. It's not very clear if you look at this, like, do we actually need that null check? Is that string going to be null? Of course, in this very simple code example, it is easy because you see get value is returning null. But if you, if you would see this in a code base and you have method calls and method change in, uh, chains into other method calls, it's close to impossible to figure out that something can be null. And Ideally, you should be doing null checks at every point in time because you have no idea what's going to be in that variable, if that's going to be null or not. For value types, it is easier. Uh, you have integers, you have bools, longs, decimals, and you just add that question mark, and the question mark mentions that this can be nullable. Uh, value types aren't really nullable. What's going to happen is if you add this question mark is the compiler is going to do a couple of things and wrap this thing in a generic nullable object. Um, but still, it will give you a couple of options to check whether that thing is null or not. Uh, and it will hint you at writing code that does the null check if it's needed. So if you look at the previous example versus an example with value types, in this case, date time, if you add that question mark there, it's very easy to spot for you that, OK, that question mark is there, so this can be null. I should check if this thing has a value. But also, if you type s dot, the completion in your IDE will automatically say, look, you have the value, but also this has value. So it's really clear uh, that you should be doing a null check there and that this thing can be null in addition to having its actual value there. So um, I think this demonstrates quite well uh, why reference types should have this question mark at some point as well, right? To make it easier to find out whether you should do that null check. So um, what are those nullable reference types? If you think about it, nullable reference types have always been in C Sharp. Every reference type has been nullable since the beginning of times. There's, there's no really, there's nothing saying you cannot put null in a reference type. With C Sharp 8, an enabling nullable reference type that gets flipped around a little bit, where you say, OK, if there's no question mark behind a string or an object or whatever, it's going to be non nullable by default. But if you add that question mark, there's some syntax there, the question mark, uh, to say that this nullable reference type is going to be nullable, and you can use that to figure out if something is going to be null or if a return value is going to be null, et cetera. 
So um, if we change our simple code example from the start there, and we do something like this, where we say, OK, we have string question mark get value, still returns null, but that's now allowed because we add that question mark. What will happen if we run this code? Compiler error. Um, depends on whether you enable warnings as errors, but yes, the compiler is going to tell you that something is off here. The cool thing is, it is only a warning, so you can run this, and when you run this, it is still going to throw that null reference exception. So um, there is no runtime safety with nullable reference types, but there is some IDE inspections, some compiler inspections that will help you uh, determine whether something can be null or not. And ideally, if you make those errors, for example, you will not be able to compile your project, and you will know, OK, I need a null check there, and I need to make sure that the compiler is happy in figuring out how all of this flows together. Um, so as you mentioned correctly, the above code is going to show some compiler warnings, actually a couple. Uh, first one is going to be on that string s equals get value there. That's going to be um, a message saying, you look, you are taking a potential null value and putting it into a non-annotated string there. That's fishy. You shouldn't be doing that. And then the next one is going to be on that s dot uh, The compiler is actually going to say, look, this is potentially null. You should fix this and do a null check. Uh, your IDE will also show those things, so Visual Studio or Rider or Resharper, they will all pop up something saying, look, this can potentially be null, you should fix this, you should look into this. Um, a nice thing there is that the compiler and the IDE will both help you write better codes uh, in terms of null safety. The compiler and the IDE will give you those warnings or errors, but also all of them have smarts on board um, that will help you make your code better. So there's a couple of options to get out of this thing where we have a potential null value in a non-nullable variable there. Uh, one is that the IDE will suggest to make this a string question mark, so a nullable string. The other one is that we add a fallback value, so it will be get value, question mark, question mark, and a default string. That's another option to make this uh, work and compile. Uh, the other thing is to actually add a check for null and just throw. That's perfectly valid, but at least you covered the fact that this can be null. Or, and this one is important, you can also suppress your nullable warnings. So you can tell the compiler, look, I know what I'm doing. Most often you don't, but let's, let's that, let that be a side note. Uh, but most often when something happens uh, and, and you add the exclamation mark at the end, so you would do get value exclamation mark, it's going to be perfectly fine. Compiler is going to be happy. The IDE is going to be happy. And at runtime, things may still blow up. But at least you, you handled the null situation there. Um, the exclamation mark, by the way, um, if you use that, who is using them in their codes? OK, a couple of people. Um, I would say it's a big anti-pattern. It's super helpful while you are migrating your code base. But it is a bit of an anti-pattern because you are actually telling the compiler a lie. and um, the runtime may punish you for that. So be careful with them. Cool. Let's talk a little bit about flow analysis. How does the compiler make this all work? How does it surface? And, and how does this really go? And instead of staying on slides, let's maybe dive into code a little bit and see how things work. So I have that code example that I had on my slides earlier. And you will see that those errors that I had are showing up here. So if I hover this get value, you will, uh, you will see that I'm potentially converting a null value into a non-nullable string. So that's not a good thing. I can alt enter on that and fix this thing and, for example, make it non-nullable. What's interesting, though, is that um, all of the flow analysis you will get in the IDE and in the compiler is actually looking at the codes and how you're handling null checks. So maybe, again, this is not super valid code and it's something that you probably should not be doing. But if you do something like if s is not equal null, you will see that this s.length warning that we just had is disappearing. So the compiler and the IDE immediately pick up that you are actually doing a null check and that you are handling the case of this being potentially null. So if I undo this code change, you will see that the s all of a sudden gets a squeal with that error and uh, back and forth. Same thing with just ch uh, changing this. So if I um, change this, this warning will disappear, but now I get a warning here saying, look, you say that you're returning an actual string, but you're returning null in this case. Uh, and then to make the example complete, I can also add the exclamation mark, and you will see all of the errors are gone. Wow. Not something you should be doing, but just to demonstrate that it's quite smart um, and that it's quite helpful to get all of those hints in your code base. And adding those annotations really makes it easy for you to determine whether you should be doing a null check somewhere or handle a null case or not. Uh, I have another example here. 
with var. Uh, var is an interesting thing because the compiler will always treat var as being nullable. So this is a string. If we would show the type here or change the actual type, this is going to be the actual type that the compiler sees here. It's always going to treat this as uh, nullable. The reason for that is that strings and, and objects and so on in C Sharp are mutable, so you can always change them. So that means if you have a var, the compiler in this case will figure out that s.length is accessible because you have an empty string in there. But because at any point in code, if you load a database uh, record using Entity Framework or something, this can happen, and there can be a null value in there. And um, this is why the compiler is always going to treat var as nullable. And then the flow analysis is going to figure out whether something is a warning or not. But uh, it's very subtle. If in your code, all of a sudden, you add this line of code, a lot of warnings are going to light up. So if you really want to be sure about the fact that something is non-nullable, you should be doing something like this, where you say, OK, this is a string. And then you get a warning saying, OK, look, this assignment of null is not something you want to do here, because you said that this is never going to be null. So that's a really important distinction. And var, even though I love var um, for a long time, it is kind of uh, tricky if you assign a null value at some point, because there's going to be a lot of warnings, but it's, it's allowed to do that. All right, so flow analysis, the IDE, and the compiler are going to go over all of the codes that you have. And based on the code pad, based on null checks that are happening and so on, it will show or hide some of the warnings that are there and determine whether, in a particular case, something can be null or not. Um, using var, again, is always considered nullable. If there's an if that checks for something that is uh, not null, for example, with that var, it's going to be fine. But remember, since things are immutable, objects and strings uh, are mutable, sorry. Uh, you can actually always assign a null value there, and that means that all of a sudden your code will light up as a Christmas tree, and you will see that that's, yeah, you're essentially messing up things. Um, this null forgiving operator, or the dammit operator, as it used to be called long ago, hence the title of the talk, uh, suppresses the warnings. So you can do that if you're migrating and you want to hide some warnings temporarily. Absolutely go for it. It's quite useful to filter out all of the warnings that may be there in your code base. But again, remember, it is a bit of an anti-pattern because you're essentially disabling your nullability analysis for both the compiler and the IDE. And it's really easy to shoot yourself in the foot at runtime with that. And you won't get a warning while designing your codes. So in summary, nullable reference types don't give you runtime safety. They give you safety, well, at least a feeling of safety while um, designing your code and compiling your code. So in the IDE and the compiler, you will get some warnings and errors depending on how you can configure it. Um, but what you will get is a lot better static flow analysis on your code. You will actually see um, what is going on, where you should be applying null checks, et cetera. So it's really useful there. Null forgiving operator, again, use it when you need it, but be careful with it and ideally use it as few times as possible in your code base. Cool. Now let's uh, switch gears. We've now seen what nullable reference types are and what they mean and don't mean. Um, let's maybe look at how they are implemented in C Sharp. Um, probably a safety warning here. I'm going to show some intermediate language code to see how it's going on under the hood. The IL really doesn't matter. What does matter is the attributes that are being added. I'll show them in a second. Um, and you can use them if you use reflection, for example, um, because it might be that at runtime you are constructing objects. It's still useful at that point to make sure that uh, you never put a null value inst into something that you didn't expect a null value. So again, looking at reference types and value types, you will see that value types are surrounded with this magic nullable um, generic class. So it's really easy if you use reflection or something to figure out if a value type is nullable, because you automatically get that type information. And you can see, OK, this integer is wrapped in a nullable, so this can be null in some cases. Reference types, though, historically have always been nullable. And nothing changes in that aspect. If you use reflection, for example, uh, everything is nullable. So even if you have a non-nullable string, for example, you can still use reflection and just put null in there. It's uh, absolutely fine. And again, you will not get a warning about that. Um, so with that information, how does the compiler and the IDE actually know about um, nullability and whether you're actually telling it that something can be null or not null? Pre C Sharp 8, um, something like this would yield um, some intermediate language. So you would write a method saying string get string 1. 
uh, and that is returning an empty string, you would get some intermediate language with exactly the same characteristics. You are returning a string that is nullable always because it's C sharp and this is how it's always been. And it's quite easy. The mapping of the types is easy, right? Um, and if you look at the IL, it's very readable that this is returning a string. It's different when you start adding annotations. Um, if we say, look, get string two is nullable, even though we always return an empty string, but we say it is nullable potentially with the question mark there, you will still see in the intermediate language codes that the return value is going to be string. So there's no information there about nullability in the return type of the intermediate language, which means if you're using vb.net or f -sharp to consume this get string two methods, they will not know about nullability there. The nullability is a custom attribute that only C Sharp really looks at, and the custom attribute is this nullable context attribute um, that is used by the compiler and by the, e, uh, by the IDE to determine whether um, the return value there can be null or not null. Um, nothing really interesting about this one. It's the nullable context attribute. So again, if you want to use reflection, there's some helper methods in .NET, luckily. But if you want to use pure reflection to look at nullability, this is the attribute to look for. Um, the attribute is given a value. In this case, the value is going to be 2. And that value 2 gives the compiler the information that it needs to determine what is going on there. Um, the value 2, and these are the potential values, the value 2 means that every reference type in a piece of code is implicitly annotated with a question mark. So in the previous example, we had get string 2 returning a nullable string. By setting this value to 2 in the nullable context attribute there, the compiler and the ID know that something is nullable. The value can also be 1, meaning it's not annotated and should be treated as non-nullable by default. I know not annotated means non-nullable. Um, and there's also the oblivious behavior where you can actually say, look, um, add the attribute, but just treat it like before C sharp 8 where everything could be null. There's more attributes. Uh, let's make our method a little bit more interesting. We now have get string tree, uh, which returns a non-nullable string and takes a nullable, non-nullable, and uh, nullable string as the arguments. So much nullable in my, uh, in my words there. Uh, if you look at the intermediate language, you will see that we still get that nullable context attribute. But in this case, the value is set to 1. So the intermediate language is telling the IDE and the compiler that everything in this getStringTree method should be treated as non-nullable. However, we have that string uh, A and string C that are nullable, and those are added by adding those nullable attributes. So there's the default for this entire bit of code, but then additional attributes are being added in, um, in intermediate language to say, look, parameter number uh, 1 and parameter number 3 are nullable, and they have the value 2, which means that they are annotated with the question mark there. So again, if you want to look into reflection, you have to look at this nullable context attribute, but also the nullable attribute if you want to learn about parameters and things like that. I don't expect you to remember this, but just in case you want to look at uh, reflection and so on, that is quite useful. Um, so the default for the method is that nullable context attribute, and per parameter, you will see that there's a nullable attribute as well. Right. Um, the compiler tries to emit as few of those attributes as possible. So uh, if you're using reflection, for example, and you want to call into a method with all of these annotations and you want to check those things, you really have to check all of the different cases because the compiler may change whatever is in there based on whether you add or remove a parameter. So it tries to emit as few attributes as possible. The reason for that is it's all additional metadata that the compiler and the ID have to parse. So um, the compiler really tries to keep it as low as possible to make sure that um, there's no, not too many of them. Question, yes? This is a good question. So for the people watching the stream, the question was, does this contradict the previous example? Because there's a default uh, saying one thing, and then everything else is, uh, is a different one. Yes and no. So if we look at the codes, the default here is uh, 1, which means everything is non-nullable by default. And that is valid for our parameter 0, which is our return value, the string um, in the public string, and also for string b. So that's essentially two of those cases, two of the other case. And in this case, the compiler just says, OK, let's, let's do it this way. 
if you would have uh, an additional nullable parameter, for example, there's a big chance that this would be value 2 and would actually say that this is nullable by default. Hope that answers the question. Cool. Um, uh, there's, there's another nullable context that you can uh, look at in your code base and so on, and it is probably the one that you will work with most. Again, previous examples were mostly about reflection. Uh, if you want to surface nullable reference types, there's a couple of options that you can configure in the nullable annotation context in your projects. So in your codes, you can always add this hash nullable and then a specific value to configure what the nullability analysis should be doing for a piece of code. Uh, you can also add this in your project value and can configure the, the project-wide setting for how you want to surface nullability. Possible values for that are disable. Essentially say, look, I don't care about nullability. Just give me like a good old C-sharp six days. Um, I, I don't want to mess with this. There's enable, which gives you all of the bells and whistles and will give you potentially a lot of warnings if you have an existing code base, right? Um, there's also warnings that gives you all of the analysis but will not really um, go as deep as the enable um, feature there. Might be useful during migration, might not be useful. There's also the annotations uh, option that you can give there, which is kind of weird to me, um, because that essentially tells the compiler, look, you don't have to analyze anything in there, but when you compile this stuff, I want you to add that nullable context attribute and all of that. Might be useful if you know what you're doing, but it, it, it's, yeah, I don't think it makes a lot of sense in most codes. Ideally, we all go to just enable and set, uh, treat warnings as errors. Which context do you use in your existing projects? Well, for new projects, and I'm happy that this is the default in new projects in C Sharp 7, uh, or in uh, .NET uh, 6, 7, and 8, uh, it's always enabled. If you are migrating existing code from a previous era or something, uh, as usual in IT, it depends. Um, so that means there's a couple of options on how you can apply nullability and can configure your projects. Um, there's a lot of people I've seen that are disabling nullability as a default and then enabling things file by file until they are through the entire code base to make sure that everything is set up. That's possible, and probably on bigger projects, this is the, the best way to go, because otherwise you will drown in the warnings that are there. Uh, there's also the, the group that says enable as a default. That's a really cool thing, but if you have a big project, you're going to have so many warnings and errors that you will probably start crying. It is a way to do it, um, but I wouldn't really recommend it on big projects. Warnings as a default is also an interesting one. You will still see the warnings, but you don't get uh, the, the compiler errors, for example. So again, it depends. And those annotations as a default, I would not go with that one because it doesn't really give you a, a big benefit. So in summary of this section, uh, you have the nullable context, which is what the compiler and the IDE will consume, and what, if you're using reflection, for example, you can also look at. There's also the nullable annotation context, which is what you will probably be doing as you are developing, where you can essentially trimming everything down, enable everything project-wide, disable everything project-wide, and gradually maybe enable it file by file, or even portions of codes um, one by one. Cool. Now, let's look at annotating your C-sharp code. Let's finally add some annotations because we've seen the theory, we've seen what it is. Let's finally bring it into our C-sharp codes. A question for all of you. Is that question mark enough to give you an idea of what the code is doing and what it is returning? If you would look at this method, for example, what it will do is it will create a so-called slug. So uh, typically, when you have a blog post or a news article somewhere, that has capitalization, that has spaces and all of that. Uh, creating a slug is typically converting everything to lowercase, maybe shortening out the shorter words there and replacing the spaces with a dash so that it can be used as a URL in, uh, in the browser, for example. This method is taking a uh, nullable string value. We do a null check there. If the value is null, we are actually returning null as well. Uh, if it's not null, we do whatever the code should be doing there and uh, return the values that we want there. Is the question mark here enough? Some will say yes, some will say no, I'm in the no camp. Reason for that is when you write code like this, where you have a slug and you say, okay, I want you to slugify the string, this is fine, you will still get the warning saying that the slug is potentially null there. Reason for that is we are returning a potentially null string there, right? So I would say this is not enough, and I would like to see this more, uh, yeah, more fine-grade, make it better. So um, 
you can actually do that. You can add more attributes on top of the ones that the compiler will emit to make this more fine-grained and give the compiler and the IDE more information about how things should work. Um, and the attributes are a bit ridiculous in naming sometimes, uh, but they are actually quite useful. Because in this case, you're actually saying, look, the return value, that string that is nullable there, is going to be non-null if some parameter is also non-null. And in this case, that is going to be value. So here we are telling the compiler, look, if we get a non-nullable string in the value, the return value is also going to be non-null. If we get null as the value parameter, it is also going to be null. And that gives you the nice effect of this, where in the first case, if you pass in null, you actually get the warning there with that first slug. And it's going to say, look, this is potentially null, and this is going to blow up at runtime. Uh, but in the second case, we are passing an actual string. And you will see that this is fine, because it is going to be non-null. Yeah, question. OK, so question here was, uh, is it better to use that uh, dammit operator there at the ex exclamation mark instead of this, uh, this null null there? Um, I would say no, because it's still an anti-pattern. You know that at this point, it's going to be non null, and it's cool. But that does mean that in every single case in your code base where you are consuming this code, you will have to add that uh, exclamation mark telling there the compiler, uh, look, this is going to be non null. So this is essentially doing the work just one time, helping the flow analyzer to make it better for everyone. Um, also, imagine you have uh, these annotations in your codes, but another team in the company is consuming this code. Thanks to this attribute, they will also know that this cannot be null, because maybe they have no idea what the implementation of this method is, right? So if they add the exclamation mark, they are in dangerous territory. They have no idea what's potentially going to happen. But in this case, it, you get the information for, uh, for the compiler and the IDE. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, you could create an overload that just accepts uh, non-nullable, for example, and then use that. That's also an option, indeed. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, in this case, this is quite nice because you only have one method, and you're actually telling the compiler and the IDE that there is only one way of doing things, uh, and that it's just to look at what value we are passing in, and then based on that, the return value is going to change as well. Uh, there's a couple of others. Uh, so if you look at string dot is null or empty, for example, in the .NET framework, you will find that there's this not null when attribute there. Um, I'm not really a big fan of how this works because it's kind of inverse. Uh, but what's happening here is essentially when is null or empty returns false, the compiler will know that the value passed or the, the, the parameter that is value here is going to be non-null. It's, it's very backwards to think about it like that, but for the compiler, this is quite useful because all of a sudden, if you do a null check like this, it knows the value is not going to be null and is able to uh, change the flow analysis there. There's a couple more there that are really head twisters I find it a bit backwards and counterintuitive. But uh, yeah, this is how it works. I would have loved to see the attribute on the method saying, look, when the value is not null, then it's going to return true or false. But this is what we got. Cool. Um, this does mean that you get that null check there. Um, you could do an explicit null check. So if string is not equals null, for example. But by doing string dot is null or empty, we're actually telling the compiler that that string dot is null or empty is also a null check. Uh, so you will see before doing that null check, the S has the squiggle saying, look, this is potentially null, not safe to do. Uh, but after doing that null check there and returning from the methods, the compiler and the ID will know that S is never going to be null in that case. Cool. Uh, there's more fine-grained annotations. There's uh, quite a bit. Um, there's a link on the slides. I'll share the slides afterwards. You will see there's preconditions, postconditions, conditional postconditions, and failure conditions. I know there's a lot of text on this slide, so instead of just going over that, I'll just give you a quick demo of what they mean and what they can do. So back to codes. If we look at annotating our codes, I have a couple of examples there. Preconditions, for example. Uh, I'm going to make this all a little bit smaller. There we go. So I have a class person with a property username. And that property is using a backing field called username. 
And the backing field has a default value. If you don't set a username, it's going to be a GUID. I also want people consuming this code to be able to set the username to null. And if they do that, I want to just reassign a new GUID to the property, just to make sure that there's always going to be a value. What that essentially means is that um, I want to tell the compiler, look, you can write a null value into this property, but you can never read a null value because there's always going to be a value. So what you can do there is add the allow null attribute, and this is going to essentially make sure that the compiler knows that that is the case. So if you look at the grayed out code when I don't have the attributes, you will see that the IDE and the compiler at this point know that value is always going to be non-nullable. So this null check and then returning a GUID is not something that will ever be run because we expect this to always be non-nullable, right? If you add this allow null, you will see it light up because now we have the case where someone can pass in a null value, um, but where reading the value is always going to be non-null. If I look at the usages there, um, if I use that person class, you will see that I can set username to null right now. If I comment out my allow null again, you will see that we get a warning saying, look, you cannot really set this thing to null because you told me that this is always non-nullable. Uh, it can be useful to do something like this. You can also do the inverse where you say, look, disallow null, uh, where you can add a, nullable, um, a nullability annotation there on the, on the return value of the username. And you can still say, look, um, I don't want you to be able to set this to null, but I know that you want to make e maybe read a null value from this one. So that's a precondition. Yes? Yeah, so question is, is this something you would recommend using? Um, depends on the code design, I would say. Um, I would personally not always go for this, but maybe you have those cases where you have a default being uh, put in place in a, in a property somewhere, and maybe this is something you want to tell the compiler, look, we have this code, we are catching this situation, and uh, this attribute is something to do that. So depends on your preference, I would say. Uh, there's also post conditions, kind of similar. Um, in this case, we can do the opposite side of things. Again, that person class, we now have a middle name. If we add this uh, middle name property, we can say, look, reading it can be null, but setting it will always be non-nullable. So not everyone has a middle name. So what you can do is say, okay, this thing is going to be maybe null, and we're now telling the compiler that, look, you can get back a null value for the middle name property if you read it, but if someone is writing into it, it's always going to be non-null. Well, this is exactly the intent of the attribute there. So the question was, is this not contradictory? Because you're saying this is non-nullable, the backing field is nullable, and you are lying to the compiler by just returning null in this case. Well, by adding this maybe null attribute, you are telling the compiler, giving the extra information that um, you cannot set it to null, but reading it is always going to be fine, for example. Yeah, but like when you read it. Uh, sorry, where reading it is potentially going to be null, but writing it uh, is fine. So you can essentially give more information there. Yeah. So reading the middle name here, you're actually telling the compiler this can potentially be null, and you actually see it in the, in the hint there that this is potentially null, but writing it is not allowed. You actually always expect a value when you write into this property. So again, giving the compiler more information, should you use it, depends on your code base, I would say, but it is quite nice that you can actually tell the compiler about all of those specific cases um, and make it better for all developers in your, in your team. There's the conditionals. We already saw this kind of, um, where you can say, look, the ret of, or this parameter value is not going to be null when the return value of this method is true. So if we add this attribute, we actually have this situation where we have a string that we set to null. If we call that isValid username methods, the compiler will know that this is also performing a null check by adding that attribute, and it's going to be perfectly fine with calling into the length property there. But if we're in the different branch there, where it is returning false, the compiler also knows that the username is still potentially null, and it will give you that warning. So again, more fine-grained annotations to make it easier for the compiler to determine what is going on there. <coughs> 
Uh, there's a couple of helpers as well. These I find quite interesting, I will say, um, because they add an attribute on something completely different from the stuff that you are consuming. So in this case, we have a person. The person has a nullable string location. And we have a Boolean that is, has location. And if this one returns true, if the return value of this thing is true, then the member location is going to be non-null. Adding this attribute means if you use this, you can use this person that has location, for example, and that is now going to be a valid null check for making sure that the location actually has a value. So it's a condition essentially saying, look, if this returns true, it's not going to be null. In the other case, it is going to be null. And again, you will see that there's a warning there. There's a couple more of those. Uh, there's, for example, a couple where you can apply something to the constructor saying, look, if this specific constructor is called, this thing that you marked as nullable is going to be non-nullable. So there, there's a couple more. I would say, look at the, at the Microsoft website. There's a couple of really interesting ones. Uh, there's also failure conditions. Most IDs do not really do anything with it, but the compiler does something with it. Uh, you have this does not return annotation, which is essentially going to tell the compiler, look, if you call into this method, it's never going to return. So everything after that, it doesn't matter if you're doing null checks or not. It's just not going to be executed. So it's not really telling anything about it's, it can be null or non-null, but it's kind of useful to tell the compiler, look, if this thing is called, then nothing is going to happen because you're safe there. Cool. Back to slides. All right, there's the Microsoft annotations in C Sharp. Um, for those of you who have been using ReSharp or Rider for years, uh, you will also be familiar potentially with the JetBrains annotations. Um, anyone using those in their code base? Okay, a couple of people, that's nice. Uh, it is quite interesting that uh, Entity Framework Core, for example, is shipping with those annotations as well because we allow a little bit more fine-grained information even. So it's kind of cool that Entity Framework is doing that because you get better nullability analysis there. Uh, what is cool is if you're using JetBrains annotations, you will also have the option, if you're using ReSharper, for example, to convert those into C Sharp annotations. So the talk is about migrating. For those people who raised their hands and said that they are using the JetBrains ones, you can essentially Alt-Enter on one of them and just say, update everything to make use of the C Sharp ones which is quite useful. Um, nullability in generics. I, I love this really small code example there. Um, there's a couple of cases there, right? You have generics, which is always going to be a type containing another type and potentially even more types. So you can have a list that is non-nullable of strings that are non-nullable. You can have a non-nullable list of strings that are nullable. And you can have a nullable list of strings that are nullable. So uh, just add a uh, question mark wherever you need it. It's quite easy to express what is going on with those types. But just in case, I wanted to show you this, that you have all of the options that you uh, may want to use in your codes. With methods and return values, for example, there's a couple of things that you will have to do. So in this case, with that find method, there's no real way to return a T question mark in this case. So you will have to say that the return value has a maybe null attribute in this case. So you will have to do that if you want to do this. Uh, there is a non not null constraint that you can use as well. So if you have a write to console method there, for example, you can say, look, the item that I'm passing in there can never be null. You can do that by adding a constraint there. So in generics, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit different from the rest of your code, but it's still very doable to express and tell the compiler uh, how things should be working. Yeah. Uh, where you do the where t is not null, uh, you can you cannot return a, a t question mark. No, because you are saying look, the t is going to be non null in this case, so it's always going to be. Um, in the previous example, yes. So with the maybe null, that is indeed indeed going to be the case. With the where not null constraint, it's not going to be the case. Uh, if you don't add the constraints of uh, t is a class, for example, it will not let you add the question mark in that case. Yeah. The, the reason for that is the difference between value types and reference types. And because the compiler treats them differently, um, you will have different results there based on what you want to do. So yeah, the class constraint also is quite helpful to say, look, compiler, this accepts only a reference type in this case. <laughs> 
Cool. Uh, referenced codes, libraries, and frameworks. Let's talk a little bit about those. If you have dependencies that all are annotated and that come with all of those annotations, it's actually quite easy to start working with nullable reference types because you will get all of those checks in your code as well and you will learn all about it. So if you use string dot this null or empty, for example, you will see that uh, you get that flow analysis and that uh, you will get null checks there and the compiler is going to be completely happy with those. Uh, nullable reference types were introduced in C-sharp 8, I think it was .NET 5 only, where most of the base class library was annotated, so it took a while for Microsoft to apply this to all of their libraries, but right now pretty much everything is annotated, so that's quite helpful. Many open source libraries are also annotated, so that's quite nice, um, so you can use them in your code and, and learn about nullability there. Um, and I would say if you are in a team where you are shipping code for other teams in your company, it's super helpful to annotate, annotate your own codes and uh, ship your code like that to the other teams in your company because they also will get the benefit of having all of those nullable uh, reference types and all of the hints that are in there. Do remember, nullable reference types are not null safety. So if you are shipping open source or commercial projects and whatever, uh, and you are annotating everything, you're only giving partial information to the, to the consumer of it. They will get all of the information at design time and compile time. But if you really want to make sure that your code is going to behave as expected, it will still have to do null checks if you are shipping that code to third parties. So um, we saw the example with all of the attributes that were there. If someone in another team is using F sharp, for example, they have no idea what the nullability is going to be, and your C sharp codes that they are referencing, for example, will still have to um, have null checks. So don't stop using them unless you are in your own world, uh, your own code base, then it's, it's maybe fine. So in summary of this section, there's more annotations than just that question mark. Um, you want to use that question mark as well as attributes to uh, communicate the intent with the compiler and the IDE so they know what is going on. You have compiler annotations. If you're using the JetBrains ones, it's quite easy to mix and match. And uh, if you are shipping code to third parties, even if it's within your company, for example, you probably still want to do null checks to make sure that things are safe. Cool. One more question, yeah. Uh, so the question is about the required keyword. I'm going to cover that in a little bit. So um, hold your horses for now. <laughs> All right. Uh, some techniques and tools that can help you update your c -sharp projects. Um, again, I talked about this already a little bit, the default nullable annotation context in your projects. I would say enable it for new projects. If you have existing projects and they're small enough, just enable it and spend the day going through all of the nullable annotation warnings you get. If it's a big project, Go file by file, maybe even snippet by snippet, or just annotate some properties that are there and just work through it um, file by file or, or snippet by snippet. This one um, I learned migrating a couple of projects is that it's always interesting to start at the center of your application code. So very often, classes that have few or zero dependencies to other classes but are being used by, by many other classes. So typically, your DTOs or POCOs, whatever you want to call them in your codes, are really good candidates to start with, because just like with async await, um, if you annotate your DTO, all of a sudden, all of the places where that DTO is going to be used have nullability information. So that's, that's quite helpful. Everything flows through your entire code base. Typically, a small change, but you get a lot of information for it. How do you find those classes? There's the resharper type hierarchy diagram. There's tools like Endepend. Visual Studio has architecture tools where you can get nice diagrams like this. The interesting thing is not what is on the slide in terms of, of, of text. The arrows are interesting. So if you go into this diagram, you will see that there's one box that has all incoming arrows. That is the one you want to start with, because that is one that has few dependencies on others, but is dependent on by many other namespaces in a project. If you would look at the details of that one, uh, in this case, it has a couple of classes there. Also, for the classes, where do you want to start? Well, in this case, the diagram is a little bit of a mess, but I found two that are really interesting, person and course. Most of those have incoming dependencies only. I think course has one outgoing dependency. Those are perfect candidates to start with um, adding nullable annotations, because anything you do there will flow through a lot of places in your code base. Per class, 
um, if you disable annotations by default in your project, you can enable this thing and then go through every property, every parameter, every constructor parameter, look at the right usages. If they are potentially set to null somewhere, you can annotate them with a question mark and say these are non-nullable. If not, you can just keep them as is and say, look, these are, uh, or you can add the question mark and, and say, look, this is non-nullable, or, or this is nullable. So I'll give you a quick example of how that could work. Um, back to codes. I have my location info. Yes, there we go. So this is a class. It, it is really a little bit of a contrived example, but it, it comes partially from a real project that I came across. Um, we have a location info class there, and location info has a country and location. And this thing is used to make sure that, um, that other applications uh, can use IP geolocation, for example, and based on that, determine the country and the location. So using this, um, there's a couple of things you can do. So ideally, we can start with making this uh, nullable. So we can say nullable enable. All of a sudden, if we would compile this, we would get some warnings and errors. Uh, but now we want to make sure that all of the properties here are actually set to a non-nullable value, because we just changed the nullability. This, is still a, this is, has now become a non-nullable string. Is that really the case? So you could look at usages. Uh, most IEs will give you a write and read icon where you can easily see is this being written to or not. Um, in my case, there's only a couple of places where the country is being set. So what I could do instead, instead of find usages, is do something like uh, Visual Studio has this as well, by the way. The analyze menu. My menu is too big. Uh, inspect, yes. I can show the value origin, and I can see where this country info can come from. So you will see that my constructor is one of the places where I'm writing into this one, but also in this new unknown place, um, and maybe a couple more places. So I can see the backtrace of where the value can come from, and you will see that in some cases we are actually setting this stuff. So it looks like um, this is quite okay for the country. Let's maybe look at our location, how that goes. So let's find the right usages there. That is in my constructor. OK, let's maybe find the right usages of my location there as well. So what I can do is a find usages. Come on. Yeah. Anyway, uh, if that would, I should stop using early access previews when I do this. Uh, if that would work, I would have discovered this location um, where I am actually potentially setting a null value to this thing. So this is the case that I wanted to discover using those value origin and so on. Um, this is a case where this thing can be null. So there's a quick fix there that the IDE will suggest, and that is, OK, change the parameter country to nullable string. I can do that for all of the related symbols, and boom, doing that, my location info now has a nullable country and a nullable country property. Was this a good approach? Maybe in your code base, but I would say maybe there's a better approach because now all of a sudden we would have to do null checks on country everywhere in the code base the country is being used because we just said this can be null. So maybe we want to undo that change and instead of just uh, checking whether the result from my database I got is not null, maybe I want to add another check where I say, okay, results.country.name uh, is not null, and maybe I want to add the same check for my, uh, I think it's city that is in there as well, location, city, yep. Uh, add more null checks so that this is always going to new up a new location info with non-nullable values, and now all of a sudden I made my code better with a small design, chain, uh, small design change, but now nowhere in my code I should add more null checks for this one. So what do you do in the case that this is null and there's no data returned from the database? Good question. Um, you can actually work with the null object pattern where you say, look, I have a new location info dot unknown that has some defaults and then work with that. Still means you should be doing potential null ch or checks for that unknown location maybe in your code and in the logic, but you will no longer get that uh, null reference exception because there's always going to be a value, ideally. Again, design time and compile time. Make sense? Cool. All right. So uh, annotate whatever you can annotate, but also redesign whenever um, there's opportunity to redesign and actually make your code better and more null safe. Um, I talked about suppressions. You can use them. And by all means, they are useful when you are migrating things, but they are also um, an anti-pattern. So remove them when you no longer need them. <laughs> 
Also, don't be afraid of null. If there's anything I want you to remember from this talk is null is not evil. It is perfectly fine. But all of the nullable reference types, all of the annotations are there for you to gain more confidence in your codes and to give the compiler and the IDE hints on how your code operates so that you can have that confidence. Uh, the goal is not to completely get rid of null in your code, so just um, try to gain more confidence and build a safety net for whatever you have in your code base there and reduce the chances of null reference exceptions. So in terms of techniques, start in the center. Uh, always enable if you have new projects. Uh, start in the center, work outwards. Start with your DTOs and so on. Annotate, maybe redesign wherever needed. Suppressions are temporary. And don't be afraid of null. And that applause means that I have few times, and I still have one sections to go through. So let's do that. There's tools that can help you. Uh, one is that value tracking. Visual Studio has this. Rider has this. This is really useful to find out where a value is coming from. I showed you it failed because of my preview version. But the idea is that you can easily get an idea of where a value is coming from. And you can update your code more easily by finding all of the usages where you are setting a value to something, for example, with the entire call chain. Um, there's also the option for automatic migrations, resharper and writer feature, where um, if you alt enter at the first character of your, uh, of your file, you can just say alt enter and say migrate to nullable enable. And what that is going to do is it's going to use the present information from base classes and so on to add annotations to that file. It's not going to be foolproof. Not everything is going to be annotated properly, because there's still going to be some edge cases. But it is a great help to get started um, with introducing nullability in your code base. Your code also has hints about nullability. So uh, if you have an existing method like this, read column, for example, where you have this string column name property, there are hints in the code that maybe uh, you, should do, sh you should make this nullable. So quick quiz. Should we annotate that string column name in this case? Should we add a question mark there? Who says yes? OK, who says no? It's fine like this. Who has no idea? OK, yeah, it depends indeed. We are doing a null check there on the first line. So we check if column name is not null. So just looking at that statement means that we should annotate with null, because we have a null check in there. So that means we expect that the parameter can be null, and we should add the annotation. However, looking at the rest of the code, you can see that we are trying to get the value and, and all of that, and always returning a default value when something is not being found and so on. So in this case, we could keep it like this and maybe just remove that null check there, because we don't really expect this thing to ever be null. So again, it depends indeed. Based on the if statement, I would say add the question mark. But looking at the rest of the code, maybe not. Again, up to you to decide. But there are hints in your code whether you should be adding it or not. Third-party libraries. I told you .NET BCL is annotated. That's awesome. Uh, some libraries are using annotations or JetBrains annotations. That's also awesome. If you go on to NuGet, there's a lot of projects that are unfortunately not annotated. That means if you bring them into your annotated code base, you should be doing uh, a lot of null checking. If you have no idea where to do those null checks, uh, there's actually a trick that you can use in ReSharp and Rider, and that is to turn on pessimistic analysis where you can say, look, everything that doesn't have a null check anywhere, treat it as nullable, and then everything will light up again with uh, a lot of warnings and errors. Something you don't want to enable continuously, so you will go insane. But it's kind of useful if you want to do that migration and look at where potential null cases are available. All right, the required property is coming. Just a quick hint. How would you go about this warning? I have a class that is doing some JSON, and I want to serialize, deserialize this thing. And I have a string property called name. And I have a JSON property called name. But I get a warning that name is not being set to a value. So it's potentially null. And this is not good. How do you fix this warning? <laughs> There's a couple of fixes that you can apply. Um, one fix is to just add a nullable annotation which is great, but you lose some of the information. If you're absolutely certain that this name property is never going to be null, fixing it like this by just annotating it loses some information for you. You will still have to do null checks, so I would not go this route. Second option is lying to the compiler and just saying the property is default exclamation mark, suppress the warning, and say, look, compiler, you're happy now. I'm setting a value, but it's still null. 
So you're lying through the compiler. I would not do this anti-pattern again. I should have a more evil font on the slide, I think. Um, another option is instead of setting that null value, you can set an unknown string, for example. This is something that could work. Seems fine. I think that's a good alternative. You can also go the annotation route, which is essentially doing the same as the previous one, where you add that allow null, uh, allow null annotation, where you have this mix of being able to allow null when setting the value, but reading is always going to be non-null. Good alternative, but I find this one quite cumbersome. The proper option is to do it like this and set required. Uh, this is a new keyword in C Sharp 11, I think, uh, where you can say, look, compiler, Whoever is going to new up a class of this instance, this property is always going to be set to a value. That's the required keyword there. Um, so you don't have to annotate anything. And if you say name is non-nullable, the required uh, keyword there is going to say, look, name is always going to be non-nullable. This would be my personal recommendation. You see that there is an asterisk. And that is that your JSON data, the source that you are reading, may still be null. So if that is something that you suspect, maybe adding a nullable attribute there is still something that you want to do. Another option that you can do with system.text.json, for example, is subscribe to this iJSON on deserialized events. And essentially, after deserialization, check if all of the conditions are met. Maybe throw, maybe log something, or, or whatever. So again, personal recommendation, but still not foolproof at runtime. But this is going to work great at design time. Uh, one last thing before I let you all go. Be careful with Entity Framework Core. If you have an Entity Framework Core project and you enable nullable reference types all of a sudden, there is a big warning in the documentation, and you will actually see this. If you do this and you script a new database migration, for example, there is a chance that your database semantics are going to change as well. So be careful if you have Entity Framework. Don't just go nullable annotate everything, because Entity Framework is making use of the annotations to determine whether a database column, for example, can hold a null value or not. So you might be surprised by just enabling things that your database schema is going to change. Probably not something you want. So again, be careful uh, with existing Entity Framework core projects. So in summary, some tools that we've seen, there's value tracking to find out where a value is coming from can help you. There's a conversion from JetBrains annotations to C-sharp annotations. There's an automatic migration you can use. Uh, you can just look at the code, see if you're doing null checks, and based on that, add the annotations. Third-party libraries, JSON is a little bit, yeah, you have to look at your source data and how much you trust it before you can actually decide, am I going to annotate or not? And be careful with Entity Framework. With that, the final summary, and I think I'm going to end on time. This is good. Um, nullable reference times, types in C-sharp give you design time safety, not runtime safety. Always keep that in mind if you are shipping your code to third parties, for example. Add null checks because null is still an option. It's just going to help you at design time. At runtime, things may still blow up. There's the annotation context that you can configure to determine how much help you want from the compiler and the IDE. There are more fine-grained annotations to communicate the intent to the compiler. So you can do that. And instead of just adding the annotation with the question mark, you can do things like writing and reading is a, is a different type of nullability. Use the null forgiving operator when, you, when it makes sense. But do remember, it is an anti-pattern. You're lying to the compiler, and you lose a lot of the help. And this is just what we want from all of this. There are tools and techniques to migrate. So use them if you want. And uh, I would say. Remember one thing, NRTs are a safety net, so there's no need to get rid of all of the null things that you may have in your code. But do annotate things, because your code will very often get less cluttered with null checks if they are not really needed. And it will actually help your fellow developers on the team. With that, thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference.